Hey, good morning team. We're looking at hydrates today. Hydrates. So really this should probably go in the nomenclature area with lectures and things like that. But um, nomen I, I, I beat you enough with an ugly stick over the head with nomenclature of all the different ionic and covalent species and acids. It's, like, it's enough, right? So I didn't want to do overkill with hydrates. But we do do a lab where we're taking percent composition Right, this this idea of percent, you know, what's the mass percent of an element in a particular compound? But we're going to do that with a hydrated compound, and figure out. Well, here's this compound that's got water in it. Hydrated? Did you feel hydrated? Oh, did you get your water? And we're going to just heat it and drive the water off and measure the mass decrease, and that's the mass of the water. Divide that by the mass of the original hydrated compound times it by 100, and you got the mass percent. So it's a pretty simple lab, but it's a great application of the percent uh, mass concept of a subparticular portion of a compound or substance in some way. But we haven't talked about hydrates. So what are hydrates, right? What are they used for? It's just a real quick little introduction, specifically how to write their formulas. They're a little weird to look at the first time because they got these little dots in them. You're like, what's that dot? Is that a multiplication sign? Blah, blah, blah. So let's clarify the language, throw some big terms at you like deliquescence and all this fun stuff. Uh, and uh, you may have run into this stuff in everyday life, but let's walk ourselves through it. But again, a hydrate, think of it like, you know, hey, if I go to the gym, I'm real thirsty. I got to hydrate up. At the, boom, so I'm drinking lots of water. I feel hydrated. If I'm not getting my water, I'm dehydrated. Well, there's a different term for that. It's called anhydrous. But let's take a look here. Let me push my kitty cat over. Hold on. He's not doing well. Sorry, my kitty cat just wanted some loving. Yay for kitties. <laughs> it's been with me for every single video we're talking 300 videos so far that old almost 20 year old cat's been by my side right in my chair next to me so yay for pets all right anyway so normally these are going to be crystalline species so we're used so used to seeing things like you know salts you know sodium chloride calcium chloride sodium sulfate copper two chloride copper two sulfate right so hey we typically think of them as well they don't have water right so we would call that an anhydrous so everything we've been talking about so far would be considered anhydrous there's no water in it but we're going to learn later ionic compounds have positive cations negative anions right and we're going to find out that water molecules which the air is full of it's dependent on your relative humidity there's water molecules all over sticking to glass sticking to your face all over the place well, they might stick to these salts because we'll find out later that water is polar. You may have heard that term. You may not have heard that term where the oxygen on the water has a slightly partial negative charge and the hydrogens have a slightly partial positive charge. So they and they spin around so they could be attracted to the ions in an ionic crystal, right? Not all of them, but some of them do this. And there's terms for this we'll talk about and define on the next uh, on the next board. But just it's just a compound or some species that's crystalline that has water molecules bound to it, right? So if I have a cation here, there might be some some water molecules electrostatically attracted to it that that get stuck. They're in between the cations and anions. They can get in between the cations and anions. Water are little tiny things, right? And they're in distinct or definite proportions. Now, there's no way we're going to be able to predict that at this level, right? Is this, you know, is calcium chloride going to pick up two waters or three? If I have one mole of calcium chloride, does it pick up two water molecules? One, five, ten, twelve, eight, seven. No way we're going to be able to predict that, all right? I will give that to you as necessary. So if it's a variable number, well, not variable, it's a distinct number, but if we don't know what it is, it might be five for this salt and ten for that compound and three for that compound. Let's just call that N, right? So we're going to have this general equation. We'll do some specific ones in the next part, where we have some, some anhydrous salt, right, which you would typically calcium chloride, CaCl2, sodium sulfate, Na2SO4, right, things like that, copper 2 sulfate, CuSO4. You just write the normal uh, chemical formula for that ionic. We're only going to deal with ionic compounds at this point. And then you put a dot and then a number and then the water molecules. And that number N represents the waters of hydration. So if I have one mole of this anhydrous compound, how many moles of water does it pick up? Or if I have one cation and one, you know, that kind of thing, how many individual water molecules? We'll think of it in terms of moles though. So that water's hydration is going to be, we're only gonna deal with integers in this class. Zero would be dumb, that would just be the hydrate, I mean the anhydrous salt. So it's gonna be one, 
greater than or equal to one, two, three, all the way up. I mean, Twelve is the highest I've seen in our classes. I guess I guess you could get more, but that that's a big number. So usually between one and ten is typically what you're going to run into. Maybe a twelve kicking around here and there. That dot is not a multiplication sign. Remember, I like to use parentheses for multiplication in my class. No X's, no dots, things like that. That indicates the that these water molecules are bound to it. They're electrostatically attracted to it. Right? We'll draw a picture of that in the next one. And we don't have to, we're not here to literally look at the structures of that. We haven't gotten in that much depth in our class anyway. But that's the general idea. So let's do a specific one on the on the next board. Kind of show you the general. I'm gonna I'm gonna baby the structure for you a little bit to give you an idea where these water molecules could go. And we'll look at, at how to name those anhydrous versus the hydrate to compound and some special terminologies here. All right here's a specific example. And once you see one, you kind of I mean it's the same thing over and over and over. You just change whatever the anhydrous salt is and the number of hydration. So. Let's take, if I just showed you CuSO4, you should be able to say, well, that's copper 2. It's a copper 2 ion and a sulfate ion, plus 2, minus 2. So that'd be copper 2 sulfate or cupric sulfate, if you like the Latin stuff, right, with the plus 2. And then we've got five waters of hydration, so pent. We're going to go penta and then hydrate. So that'd be copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. That's all you do. If that had been a 3, I'd go trihydrate. If that was a 10, I'd go decahydrate. If it was 1, I'd go monohydrate. So you just use the same prefix as you would like when you're naming um, covalent or molecular compounds. All right? So just the normal name of the anhydrous salt, and then the, give a prefix for the number of waters of hydration, and then add hydrate. That is the, and that'll be a solid, and that's going to be the hydrated compound. This would be the anhydrous salt by itself. So we could heat that because the, the water molecules aren't chemically bonded like like a like an ionic bond or or some kind of covalent bond. They're just attracted electrostatically. We'll learn about hydrogen bonding and stuff later. Um, so if you look at the structure in this, you don't. If you don't want to write this down, that's okay. I just want you to give a rough idea where you know if we had copper two sulfate anhydrous, you just have sulfate copper two sulfate copper two. Uh, you'd have this three dimensional lattice right of these alternating cations and anions. But the copper two gets these little water molecules that get in there between the sulfates and the and, and the copper two in these little areas in there. So the copper is a positive two, and so the water molecules rotate around. So the more negative oxygen faces it. We'll talk about that later on in the semester. But you get these four little water molecules stuck in there, and then you get one bound to the sulfate here, and that happens in a five to one ratio for every copper sulfate. All right. Um, Think of that as, you know, that formula unit, the copper sulfate, you're going to get five waters in there. So if I have the sulfate and another copper over here, I'm going to have four waters on the copper, one on the sulfate. If I put a copper over here, four waters on the copper, you know, one on the sulfate, and you get this repeating pattern in three dimensions, so all these water molecules in there. But I can just heat it up, and those waters go, bye bye So we'll do that on the next uh, board. We'll heat this compound, show you how it goes from the hydrate to the anhydrous salt. Um, and obviously the name just... You put the pentahydrate on there for the hydrate and take it off for the anhydrous salt. And we'll talk about some, we'll do some um, definitions you're going to need to know. All right, let's get our first definition here. And then they're big words, big words in chemistry. We like small ones like salt and water. So if we heat a hydrate, right, you've got those, those weakly bound water molecules, but they're mo the majority of them, room temperature is not going to get rid of them. They're going to be hanging around. So if we heat them up, say put them in an oven, uh, heat them up over a Bunsen burner, just apply some energy there, it will break that attachment of the water molecules and boop! And so that hydrate, right, then becomes the anhydrous salt plus the waters of, of the, the water vapor just dissipates into the air. I guess you could capture it if you wanted to, if you're, if you're thirsty and willing to go through all the effort. <laughs> right? I wouldn't bother with it. And a lot of times you'll actually see a difference. So I've seen ones where maybe this was white, and that was white, but it looked flakier. Uh, but I've seen ones where the colors change. So maybe this was uh, blue, and then that was white or something. So, so it, sometimes the color change is quite noticeable. Sometimes you just you have to look really close, and you can see a, a consistency change between the hydrated one and the anhydrous one. Of course, we could reverse this process, right? If we uh, cool that back down, they, that might spontaneously, the anhydrous salt might spontaneously reabsorb that water. We'll show that in the next board. But some cup, not many, not many, but there's a few hydrates that you don't even need to heat it. Just room temperature, uh, the, the current temperature is enough to drive those waters off. So it spontaneously loses those water molecules without any outside addition of energy. That's called 
efflorescent, right? An efflorescent hydrate loses. This process happens. See that little red triangle? That means heat added. If you don't need that, if it just happens on its own spontaneously, then that's an efflorescent, and it's undergoing efflorescence. Great hangman word, by the way. So let's look at the reverse process. What if we have a, an anhydrous salt that spontaneously, like a sponge, goes... I don't know if that's what it sounds like when it's sucking water molecules out of the air and incorporating them into its crystalline structure, like a sponge. And some, some of them suck more than others. Okay, the, the water, some will take in 10 moles of water for every one formula unit, right? Some maybe one or two. But what's the term for that and what's the equation? It's just the opposite of this. Let's do it. Let's reverse the process, right? So let's say we've got an anhydrous salt, right? We're just reversing what we had on the last board. And then it just, we, so maybe, maybe we heated it up, put it in an oven and take it out, it cools at room temperature. And when it hits room temperature, it starts going, hmm, I like water molecule, give me water molecule. It starts sucking them in like a sponge and it picks up a certain number. No way we can predict what that water's hydration will be, but you see the plus sign? So the water vapor in the surrounding air or atmosphere is separate from the anhydrous salt. When it absorbs it in, that plus sign becomes a dot. And if you look at the last board, if you have the hydrated salt and you heat it, the dot becomes a plus sign, meaning they separate out. All right? So simple process there. So anhydrous salts that spontaneously absorb water molecules from the surrounding air or environment are called hygroscopic, hygroscopic. Okay, not all of them do that, but the ones that do make it a big nightmare in lab, right? If you're trying to figure out the, the purity and the masses and all these kinds of things, it's like, ah, oh, you got to include the hydrates. It's a, it's a big pain in the butt. We'll do a couple labs where we got to watch out for that. Now, there are a few, like some friends in college, you know, when we were partying, didn't know when to stop, <laughs> all right? So there was a few that'd be like, okay, I'm all done, you know, and there's some that just keep going, keep going. So these anhydrous salts that keep absorbing water and keep absorbing water and they don't know when to stop end up dissolving themselves. It's kind of cool. You can leave these, the little solids out. You know, if you have a watch glass, you just leave it out. And you, it's and after a few minutes, they get this kind of wet layer and then if you come back half an hour later, it's a puddle. You're like, what the heck happened? It absorbs so much water vapor from the surrounding air. It dissolved itself, forming a solution. That's called deliquescent. And the process is deliquescence. I dealt with this when I was getting my PhD. Um, we have had some sodium hydroxide, the pellets of sodium hydroxide, and they had a tendency to absorb a little too much water and dissolve themselves. And sometimes if you have the jar or whatever, you'll see that the cap to the jar is stuck. Because what happens is that if you leave it partly open, if you got any salt around the outside of there, it absorbs enough water and dissolves itself. And then you cap it up, and that little area's around there, it loses the water again, and then it re-solidifies in there. It's like, <laughs> it's a big pain in the butt. But there are some, some solids that are deliquescent and undergo deliquescence and dissolve themselves, right? <laughs> so let's, uh, I'm going to introduce a term called the desiccator and um, or a desiccant, which you may have heard of before, and then we're going to be done. Just a quick little introduction to these. All right, we're going to go, I'm going to go through this in my lab videos. We're actually going to show you how to use desiccators and whatnot, but hyd hygroscopic salts obviously can be used to, as a purpose to create a dry environment. If I want to create a super dry environment where there's no water vapor, maybe around electronic components, maybe in a laboratory environment, I don't want to contaminate my sample with water vapor. I don't want to leave it out because there's a relative, you know, I'm in Southern California. The relative humidity is pretty small, but even there it can absorb water molecules, you know, slowly over time or have water bound to it. So if I want to create a super dry environment, I can make a sealed container that I can open up. And uh, I wish I had one with me, but it looks like cat litter sometimes, right? So the bottom of it, you just fill with this, these desiccants, right? Which are hygroscopic salts that are anhydrous at the time. Maybe I put them in the oven, heat them up to drive the water off, and then put them in the bottom of this container. And then I can put like a tray in there, and then I can put samples in there and cover it up and seal it from the atmosphere. And the desiccant sucks all the, well, the majority of the water vapor from the air inside that desiccator, creates a dry environment. You maybe have seen that when you get shipped packages of electronic components, there'll be these desiccants. Sometimes in uh, vitamins, I take lots of vitamins and, and supplements and medications and because I work too hard apparently, and I need a lot of 
medicine. But anyway, <laughs> that's beside the point. <laughs> Another hospital trip or working too hard. You'll find these little packets of this, these little granular material. That's a desiccant. It's absorbing water vapor and trying to create a dry environment, right? Hey, pretty cool. So we're going to go through. I'm going to show you how to use desiccators properly without breaking them. And you don't want to crack that seal and have it reabsorb. Because what we're going to be doing in a lab is taking a high, fully hydrated compound, weighing its mass, heating it to drive the water vapor off, and then weighing it again and looking at the mass decrease and taking the mass of water lost over the mass of the hydrate times 100. And that's the mass percent, right, of water in that compound. But we're going to have to heat it several times to make sure the water's gone. But if we run out of time during the day, you can't heat it once, drive part of the water off, and then store it in your lab locker. Because over the, over the night, it's going to reabsorb all the water back again. That'd be horrible. So you want to put it in a dry environment, which is a desiccator. All right. And then you pop it in there, seal it off. We know it's nice and dry. You come in the next lab period, pull it out. You don't have to worry about that having reabsorbed water, and you can continue along in your merry way. So, but I'm pretty sure you've run into these um, over your lifespan in some certain way. Hydrates, my friends, kind of cool stuff.